The Supreme Court has unfortunately just ruled that religious schools cannot be excluded from government programs that offer tuition aid for private education. Now, this is a fascinating case, particularly because it would mean that taxpayer money would be funneled to religious institutions, regardless of the practices within those religious institutions. Even if these religious private schools are discriminating against various members of the community, it doesn't matter. According to the Supreme Court ruling and the conservative justices within the Supreme Court, we have to fund them. And they cannot be excluded from these tuition aid programs. So the 6-3 outcome could fuel a renewed push for school choice programs in some of the 18 states that have so far not directed taxpayer money to private religious education. The most immediate effect of the court's ruling beyond Maine, and Maine is where the case originated from, probably will be felt next door in Vermont, which has a similar program. So it's important to understand what the program is, right? Why is money being funneled to private schools anyway? I mean, that practice should be banned. But what happens in certain states, particularly particularly in places like Maine, rural parts of that state will not have any public schools available. And to kind of fill that gap, private schools pop up. And obviously private schools charge a tuition. And so the state government will implement some sort of program to help students in that area pay for the private education in that area. Now I would argue we should build more public schools, but that is not what's happening. And one exclusion in the main law was religious institutions because we're supposed to have a separation of church and state. Taxpayer money should not be supporting and it should not be funneled to any particular religious organization. But that is not what the Supreme Court decided. Chief Justice John Roberts is the one who wrote the majority opinion here. And he says, well, excluding these religious institutions is religious discrimination. That's essentially what he's saying. Maine's non-sectarian requirements for its otherwise generally available tuition assistance payments violates the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Regardless of how the benefit and restriction are described, the program operates to identify and exclude otherwise eligible schools on the basis of their religious exercise. I would argue that these are not otherwise eligible schools because these are religious institutions that are not supposed to receive taxpayer money, right? Whenever we do a story about a private school that's engaging in some sort of weird practice, whether it's discriminating against students who might have engaged in premarital sex or discriminating against LGBTQ educators. The argument is, well, it's a private institution, they're not receiving public funds. So unfortunately, they're able to carry out these practices. But now, according to the Supreme Court, they're able to carry out the discriminatory practices and we still have to fund them. And I think that's outrageous. So David, I wanted to get your thoughts on this because this is something that the right wing has been fighting for. For I mean, it's not a new debate, it's not a new issue. This has been an ongoing battle for 50 plus years. Yeah, and to me the danger is not just that the wall separating church and state has come tumbling down, but the implications are go well beyond religion. And I'll give an example, here in Connecticut, not far from where I live, there is a golfing academy. Yes, golf, students can live year round in these dormitories and they can train on golf. Golf is their religion. So now I think this particular golfing academy, if they wanna try to help attract more students, they're gonna be able to say, hey, based on the Supreme Court ruling, golf is our religion. So hey, Connecticut, you need to give us some money, just like you're gonna have to give money to these religious private schools. We're a private school and we just happen to really like golf. That's where this is heading and that's why it's so insane. Once you obliterate the line between public and private, It doesn't really matter whether it's religion or not. There's all kinds of things that come into play. And I just think that the taxpayers in Maine are getting screwed, just like they're gonna get in Vermont. Because why should you be paying taxes to help somebody who chooses to live in a particular area? You you, you wanna live in a particular area, that's fine. You go to the public school there. If there's no public school, okay, maybe there's great that there's somebody else that's stepping in. But again, these are choices that as a taxpayer, I just. I just find it reprehensible that this is how Maine legislators are gonna try to start doling out money now. This is the culmination of a decades long a decades long battle that the right wing has engaged in. And it's really important to understand that we didn't get here like spontaneously, magically. There was a lot 
of right wing grassroots activism that's been really growing over the last 50 plus years. And this particular case reminded me of what ended up galvanizing the evangelical right in this mm. country back in the mid 1970s, okay? Because it wasn't that evangelicals were just hardcore against reproductive rights for women. In fact, there were many outspoken prominent evangelicals at the time who were completely against regulating women's bodies. They saw a, a, a woman's right to make decisions about her body, a medical freedom for women, right? I mean, there were of course some members of the religious right who disagreed with that take, but it was mostly split. And so how do we get to a point where the religious right kind of like coalesced around this message, this anti-reproductive rights message? Well, and by the way, how did religious leaders start working together? Well, it started happening in the era of integration in public schools when some members of the evangelical right hated the idea of sending their children to schools with black students. And they decided to do something about it. And I think this video does a good job explaining the roots of what we're experiencing today. So let's watch. There were segregation academies, church sponsored, that were applying for tax exempt status. Then in 1969, a group of African American parents in Holmes County sued the Treasury Department to prevent three new segregation academies from getting that tax exempt status, and they won. The court ruled that any organization that engages in racial segregation or racial discrimination is not by definition a charitable institution. The following year, President Richard Nixon ordered the IRS to enact new policy denying exemptions to all segregated schools. In 1971, the Green v. Connolly District Court case ruling upheld the new IRS policy. And evangelical leaders didn't like it, which is where Paul Weyrich re-enters our story. Paul Weyrich finally found the issue that would get the attention of people like Jerry Falwell, who had his own segregation academy in Lynchburg, Virginia. Bob Jones Jr., Bob Jones University, and a broader array of evangelical leaders. So, like, what Paul Weyrich did was go to all of these evangelical leaders and say, yo, that tax exempt status is about to be ripped away from your segregated private institution. We need to work together to represent what he referred to and what they built called the silent minority, right? Or silent majority, the silent majority. And so that galvanized the religious leaders. And then they used abortion to galvanize right wing voters. And in the end, again, decades later, they really got what they wanted, right? They crafted a Supreme Court that's full of conservative justices that's now totally okay and has ruled in favor of funneling taxpayer money to religious institutions. And this, this is, is part of yeah, yeah and this is ahead. part of the war against public schools because why this war against public schools? Well, think about it. Uh, and a lot of religious, you know, right wing evangelicals, they like to teach that there's no such thing as LGBTQ. There should be no equality between men and women. Men are superior, women should be subservient. It's the opposite in public schools where we welcome integration. We welcome the idea that women can achieve as much as men. We try to teach basic facts and science. All these things are an anathema to the religious right wing, particularly a lot of the more evangelical groups. So what do they do? Well, they say, well, we're gonna declare war on the public schools and we're gonna get money away from the public schools and funnel it back to our schools where we can teach whatever the heck we wanna do. Um, and unfortunately, as you pointed out, there's now a majority in the Supreme Court that is essentially rubber stamping each of these battles they wanna fight. Yeah, and I mean, we could feel helpless about it, which you know, obviously that's tempting. But I think we could also learn from what the right wing did to organize and accomplish what they accomplished. And it, it'll take decades, it'll take a long time to just reverse the damage that's being done by the religious right in this country. But I mean, what other choice do we have at this point? Just give up, we can't do that. Right. But it's, it's important to learn from what they've done. Yeah, to learn from what they've done and try to figure out, okay, if you're a local community, you care about public education. There are a lot of communities now where parent groups are getting together and saying, okay, what can we do? Forget about the state dollars because the state is cutting money to public education and maybe maybe they'll start giving money to, to private education now. Well, there are a lot of parent groups that I think are trying to take back some power, whether it's school boards or whatnot, saying we as parents 
have to do better in terms of fundraising and trying to make sure that kids who may not be able to afford to come to our school, that now that they can, that make sure that we're integrating, make sure that the curriculum is teaching the good and the bad of American history. And perhaps if there's more parental involvement, which I think there is in a lot of communities, maybe that's the first step towards trying to reverse some of this. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we see conservative parents getting real active with the school boards. I think that those on the left would be best suited to engage as well.